Hey, what's up? Hello. I hope you all are doing well. For the three of you who I know are going to ask about my hair, no, I didn't cut it. It's just pin, pinned up in the back. Today is the day that I'm filming my quarter three wrap up for 2023. Turns out that I've read 13 books in the last quarter and I attribute that to having some time off in the summer and being on two incredibly grueling international flights uh, for a conference that I had to attend over in Europe, technically Eurasia, whichever Turkey, now Turkey might be. Anyway, none of that matters. Let's talk about the books. Interestingly, none of these books are ones that I physically have in my possession. I did have one of them at one time that uh, I purchased from the library book sale. You'll have seen it in a previous video or I think I may have hauled it. Uh, and it went back to the library book sale because it was not great. We'll get there in just a moment. But first we'll talk about Wahala by Nikki May. Uh, I read this book in July. We read this for book club. I gave it four stars. This book is about three women, all of whom are living in London and all of whom are somehow of Nigerian descent. Uh, they are a tight trio of friends and that trio gets disrupted when uh, the friend of one from the past gets uh, gets in the way. She just kind of shows up on the scene and she causes trouble, um, or wahala as it were. And I give this book four stars. This very much felt like like a thoughtful sardonic beach read. My book club thought that it needed some more depth. I thought it had a perfectly fine amount of depth. Uh, and the reason that I took star off is I think because I kind of saw where it was going pretty early on, but I really appreciated the way that the author wove the interloping character across all three of the other main characters uh, in different ways in the most sort of insidious and evil and disruptive and just like terrible, terrible way possible. She was a bad person <laughs> and you get that from the very, very beginning. Pretty much the plot of the whole book. It's not a spoiler and mm, textbook person you're supposed to hate. So I went from that excellent piece of contemporary fiction to a book called To Scott to Handle by Grace Burroughs. Now if I'm going to read a mass market paperback romance I am only going to read one that has to do with Scotland. That's where I'm at in my life. I enjoy these books for the formula. I love plotting out like ah here is the part where it's the build up to them getting together and here's them getting together and here's the devastating event. And then here is the thing that all goes wrong in the surrounding world that's around the devastating event. And then here's the last like 20 pages of repair. This book was objectively terrible. I gave it one star because it, it still did have a plot, but this book was objectively poor. Number one, it did a disservice to people who are Scottish. It employed all of the usual tropes of like, ah, oh, I can turn this person Scottish by making them say these three phrases over and over again. Badly done, Grace. Badly done. There was not a great plot. The dialogue between all of the characters was garbage. It was unbelievable. I could have written a better book than this in my school. It wasn't awful in the same way that people just consider romance novels to be awful. It was objectively terrible writing. It was a not good plot. It was peppered with all of these orphans and too many members of the main character's family who were intermarried with members of the other main character's family, which made everyone's relation to each other a little bit dodgy. And then also the family tree was a little confusing because so many of them had similar names and there was a family tree in the front of the book, but the names that were being used for people who were dukes or duchesses or earls of something were not the names that were in the family tree, so you didn't really know who anybody was supposed to re be related to. It was a mess. The whole thing was a mess. Don't read this book. It was bad. There is much better, much better historical romance out there for you to read. Too Scott to Handle was too bad for me to recommend. Our next book for book club was Thankfully Better, and that is The Personal Librarian, and this book was co-authored, so it's written by two people, Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray. This is the story, uh, the true story actually, of the woman who was the personal librarian to J.P. Morgan of J.P. Morgan Chase. She did so much for him. She was such an important figure in his life and her story often goes untold, which is why these two authors wanted to bring it forward. I think this book, while bringing some really important history of a woman of color to light, it is lacking in the fact that it tried too hard 
to stick to the realities of her life and there was some invention there, there is some some authorial license being taken in what happens and names and things but it tried so hard to stick to the actual facts and to give everyone the actual facts of what happened which it needed to that the plot was not interesting it was just sort of like here's a recitation of all of the things that have happened to her she doesn't have like the most terrifying dialogue about it and I say that because there are a lot of points in this book where it's made clear that the main character is very afraid uh, that a secret about her and her race will come out and I just didn't believe that she was afraid. The The way that the plot surrounded all of the instances where she reported feeling those things did not give the reader the sense that she was actually in any kind of peril. It was kind of like a little bit, you know, oh, this might be suspicious, but I'm going to wrap it up and everything is going to be okay. So that's my interpretation as somebody who's never had to really have that fear in life and moving through life based on the color of my skin. So I'm probably misinterpreting it. It's all, it's so very possible um, that even the smallest things, and we know this to be true, right? Even the smallest possible instances uh, might feel unsafe for someone. But from a, from a narrative perspective, I felt she could have built uh, that sense of fear around these things more with the two the two authors actually. I just felt like I could have been pulled along in the plot at so many points more and instead just listen to a recitation of facts about this person's life. My book club however really enjoyed it. Uh, on the whole I gave it three stars and that was <laughs> that was the next three star book that I read in August and there were very many. I followed that with a book called Flying Solo by Linda Holmes. Um, I think I listened to this on audio actually and this is by the author of Evie Drake Starts Over which I really enjoyed. Um, this is a contemporary romance and I think the whole premise of this was to give people in, like a non-traditional ending like a romance that forced you to accept non-closure which it totally did and it says that right up front like that's the whole that's the premise of this book so again not a spoiler and I like uh, Linda Holmes writing I like that her characters are generally um, in an age bracket that is not written about and so her characters are I'm not gonna say a little older uh, but they are not in their 20s or 30s they are beyond that and that was the case here I appreciated that there was a character in this that was a librarian and I gave this um, four stars because I thought most things were were great about it. I like Linda Holmes' style of writing. I like the level of introspection. Uh, I like sort of the righteous anger that came to this character when she realized that she had been wrong. I liked how she always wrote her as being true to herself and was very reflective. However, by the end, I was really struggling to see how she was going to wrap it up in a functional way, like a, a way that would actually reflect someone's reality even though so often in fiction we turn to fiction because it doesn't reflect things that are part of reality but it was very clear that this book was trying to mirror that and I don't know that the solution that was conceived was something that would functionally work but every person is different even these fictitious characters like are entitled to trying their own way to have a relationship so I hope it works out for them I guess uh I would recommend this book if you like Evie Drake starts over then you will probably also enjoy this um, but go into it knowing that it does not necessarily follow the second half of the romance genre formula. I then listened to a book by Talia Hibbert. I read two Talia Hibbert books uh, this quarter, the first one being called Highly Suspicious and Unfairly Cute and this was a contemporary romance. It was about two high school students who were part of like this leadership program which involved a lot of camping and neither of them was like super into camping with Talia Hebert's books a lot of the time she focuses on one character having a chronic condition or chronic pain which I appreciate her doing um, and one of the characters in this book has I believe obsessive compulsive disorder and so they were working through that at a teenage level. This honestly was just like another really cute book like a way to go starting right out the gate with Talia Hebert working with with like younger characters. I would not say that this is a YA book to be honest. I would say that this is a book for adults that happens to feature characters who are teenagers. Just gonna be clear about that. That's a different genre. Maybe she did write it as a YA book and I just have not made it that far in my learning about the things that I read. But honestly this feels much more like an adult book. They handle things in a very adult way. They deal with a lot of the same uh, tropes about like oh I can't be somebody that ever deserves love as we as we deal with in um, adult contemporary romance so 
all in all, pretty good. There are some highly unrealistic things that happen in, in this book uh, that would certainly cause someone who is looking for a book to reflect reality again uh, to, to raise an eyebrow, but it's very enjoyable. Tell you Hibbert's characters are, as usual, people of color in a white-dominated British society, so always good to read about that. And if you didn't like the camping in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, you might like the camping in this, so worth a listen. I then moved on to another three-star book, which was actually the first book I read on my Kindle. If you have been watching us on this channel for a while, you will know that for the longest time, both Bex and I were very anti-e-reader. And something possessed me to buy a Kindle, and I don't know what it was, but I got one at an excellent price. And the first book that I read on my Kindle was The Hotel Nantucket by Ellen Hildebrand. I had heard a lot about this author, just, you know, as, as somebody who has visited the island of Nantucket off the coast of Massachusetts a couple different times. I've heard a lot about this author. She, I believe, is a local celebrity there, and I suspect this is her newest book. I could be wrong. I don't really know about her canon. There are people that know a lot more about it than me. But this book was about a brand new hotel that was opening on Nantucket. It was like the most posh, five starriest five star hotel. It was being purchased by uh, a man who lived in the UK and it was like a venture capital thing. It was being run by a woman who was coming out of a bad relationship where someone had cheated on her. Um, and there are all of these eclectic guests that come to the hotel and the, the perspective shifts between the different hotel guests, the different hotel staff, and a ghost who is living in the hotel because it used to be something else. And everyone in this book is trying to have their story told. And I love the way that it shifted all around. Again, I think at the end, the plot was wrapped up like a little too quickly. There were a couple different things where I was like, we could have, we could have not done that and everything would have been cool. Everything would have worked out pretty much the same if you had just left this bit out. So it felt a little uh, overwrought and tropey toward the end. But on the whole, I really enjoyed this book. There were a number of characters that you got to know in this in a very like deep, dark, upsetting way. There's a lot of drama going on in this book. Like this is this is a soap opera in a novel. So if that's your vibe, highly recommend. it. I read this in August. It made me feel very summery, kind of brought me back to all of the places that I've visited once or twice out on the island. So I guess I'll have to read more of this author's work to figure out whether or not this is a, a vibe that I can get on board with every summer. Maybe this will be my new summertime author. I then moved on in August to give four stars to Love Theoretically by Allie Hazelwood. Allie Hazelwood is someone who we've all heard a lot about if you spend any time on the book related internet. She's the author of The Love Hypothesis, followed by Love on the Brain, and this is her third book, Love Theoretically, if you're not counting all of the novellas. This is her best work to date, honestly. It is the best story, it is the best uh, writing, it is the best set of characters, and it is the best character who maintains a singular focus on cheese, one of the best foods, throughout the entire novel. All three of Ali Hazelwood's main books are, are pretty much the same. They are all steminists, which is STEM, feminists, women in STEM, the field of STEM, contemporary romance. These two are physicists. There's a great divide between them. Nobody really specifically annoyed me, although the relationship between I think the main character and her roommate started to like grate on me a little bit. There was a lot of confusion around like the point of of disaster in the in the romance formula plot. There was a lot of confusion going on there, all of which was a little bit smoothed over by a, a kindly older woman. So if you're you're into Ali Hazelwood and the Steminists, uh, Steminist novellas, this I think is the best one. And if you don't think this is the best one, I encourage you to tell me why in the comments because this is this is by far for me like this is the best one. For our September book club book at the library we then read All's Well by Mona Awad who's the author of Bunny if you've read Bunny. 
Uh, moving into September, September is a back to school time, so I wanted to pick out a dark academia book. This book is about a woman who has had a career as an actor and was performing in a production of All's Well That Ends Well, the Shakespeare play, and unfortunately she had a tragic accident. It's left her in like considerable amounts of chronic physical pain for which no amount of physical therapist or doctors or or anyone of any type of healing or medicine or healthcare capacity can do anything about. She is the director of the theater department at a small private university and she's trying to stage her own production of All's Well That Ends Well to a absolutely mutinous cast of teenagers who hate her, who don't understand her, who kind of I think secretly make fun of her pain. She's constantly in pain and she's she's honestly living the worst life and doing a lot of self-medicating and a lot of drinking. This book really aims to make clear how often women are not believed when they talk about how much pain they're in, but it also does so in a way that is non-linear in narrative. This book feels so fever dreamy, quite literally like fever dreamy, or I imagine what uh, it is like in terms of your subconscious when you are super, super high, because there's a lot of stream of consciousness back and forth in and out of her daily life and where she is and when she's laying on the floor in pain and when she's being helped and these three men who she encounters in a bar who may or may not really be there and what's real and what's not are two very blurred lines that cross all the time and she is most certainly an unreliable narrator but this book is absolutely about uh, someone who works in performing arts and has a very damaged, damaged background and sense of self. It's otherworldly, it's strange, and it's very, very dark. I loved this book. I gave this book four stars. There were points at it where I was like, I can't even do this. This is too hard to follow. And then once I pushed through those moments, there were other points in it where I said to myself, I don't even know what's going on, but I am on a ride with her right now. So four stars for all's well. If weird stuff is not your jam, if you want a very structured narrative with a narrator that you can trust, this book is not for you. But if you're willing to explore into that world of uh, not really sure what's going on at any moment. This is, this is super fabulous. I followed that up with a short cozy mystery called Murder in Postscript by Mary Winters. Uh, I gave this book five stars. This was my first five star book of the year. This was a cozy mystery that was definitely a little bit of a romance. It was like leading into maybe the next book being a romance, but you can tell these characters are like figuring each other out and that maybe in the next book there might be uh, more overtures of them getting together or like being in the same place with each other without a chaperone or something but this is a this is a story of a woman who is uh in in the old times I'm not going to decide whether it's Victorian or Regency or, or or what period of England it is but the old times uh and she has lost her husband whom she didn't really love. She's 26, uh, but she cared for him a lot and she is now a widow and she has been left with his young niece to care for. And she has a secret and it's that she is an agony aunt. So she has taken a job, even though she is a lady of, of the nobility, uh, she has taken a job writing an advice column for one of the magazines. And so each chapter is preceded by a, a person writing to her for advice and her response in the chapter normally has something to do with the type of advice that she's giving for that person you know should I should I wear these particular ribbons or how do I tell somebody that they are you know my sister is terrible and I really hate my cousin's dress and is it appropriate for me to say something like that uh, so she's she's going through all of these different letters until she gets one that uh, says that this woman is about to be murdered and she actually asks to meet her in person and she feels like somebody has murdered her uh, her employer and, and then she finds someone has turned up dead and she hops on the case trying to figure it out. It brings her closer to this other friend of the family who is of course like a viscount or an earl or something or a duke, something like that. And I just thought this was so well written, 
well plotted and well set up for a series. You got just enough in terms of the two of them figuring out their friendship and relationship. You got the main character who is dealing with her own internal struggle of, you know, I married this man when I was young. I really cared about him, but I don't love him. Now I'm stuck with his family. I really want to be a mother to this this little girl and trying to like figure her life out. So she's got her own self, her relationship to this new person, and her commitment to her work and solving this mystery. And each of those things feels really well defined and really detailed and full. And th at the same time, all three of those uh, compartmentalizations are woven very nicely into each other. It's done so in enough of a lighthearted way that you still feel like you're you have the lightness of reading a cozy mystery but you're you're also getting a little bit more depth than I think other cozy mysteries that I've read uh have have provided to me. The only part of this book that I was a little uh kind of eye rolly at was some of the content and the names of uh the <laughs> the letters that she receives in the mail as an agony aunt. Some of the women who are are writing to her who just take her word as absolute scripture and they give these these silly monikers um which they're just they're silly and they kind of after enough chapters you kind of have to roll your eyes at them a little bit uh, but I cannot wait for the next book in this series to be published they're they're just lovely and and fun and they keep you interested without being uh really dark and deep and and troublesome like the like the last book I was talking about five stars I think this might be my only five star book of the year or if if it isn't the only one it's definitely one of very few it might be the second so fascinating that that's what it was. If you can imagine, I'm, st I'm still telling you about books that I read in September, the last of which was a book called Woke Up Like This by Amy Leah, and I saw this was being published by Mindy Kaling in her new imprint, I think, of Amazon, uh, called Mindy's Book Corner, Mindy's Book Club, Mindy's Book Something, and I read this on my Kindle. This is essentially like a YA version of 13 Going on 30, that's what it's billed as. That's 100% what it is. It's about these two kids in high school who do not like each other, but you can obviously tell that they really do like each other and they're struggling with their friendships and they're both trying to put the prom together and somebody falls off a ladder and they both wind up, you know, 15 years into the future and they're 30 years old and now they have to get back to the present and God, when they get back to the present now, they, they can't just not remember what they've seen. So if you're familiar with the plot of 13 going on 30, this is really similar. Uh, it's pretty cute. I thought some of the the dialogue was rough. It suffered from one of my biggest pet peeves, which is people calling each other uh, their their names in dialogue when there's no one else in the room. I, I just I just think we need to stop doing that, especially since uh, these two people predominantly go by their surnames each time, and I also have problems with people doing that as well. <laughs> Um, there was just too much name mentioning the whole time. I didn't think the auxiliary characters were all that supportive. Um, there's one in particular who they both kind of have conflict with, but there's another one who sort of just only seems like they're there to advance the plot. If this is going to be the beginning of like one of those series that focuses on all sort of these characters in turn, I can definitely tell you which one is coming next. It was fine. It's fine. It was a fine book. It was enjoyable. It was cute. It was fun. Uh, I'm fascinated to look at some of the other stuff that Amy Leah has, has written because it's all about influencers and I didn't realize we were already writing books about like influencer culture at this point in society. So I'm fascinated by that. But if you want to take like one of the fresh off the press Mindy's Book Corner, Mindy, it's, I think it's Mindy's Book Corner, uh, reads, this is, this is a cute one to go with. It's a, it's a plot that a lot of us who, you know, grew up in the age of millennials uh, are familiar with. Finally, we get to the three books that I've read this month in October, uh, which the first one is The Princess Trap, also by Talia Hibbert. This book was intense and so so different uh from the one that I mentioned before. This is about a woman called Cherry who works like a job she doesn't really care about in an HR office at a private school uh in the UK and that private school is being visited by the prince of a uh Nordic or 
perhaps Danish. It's not really clear. I'm pretty sure it's Danish, but like a pretend principality in, in Denmark. Um, prince from there and she is swept off her feet by them. It's very much like lust at first sight for the two of them. There's a lot of intensity that happens uh, right out the gate in this book. Uh, which I was, I guess, not prepared for, but she finds herself in a situation where she has to pretend to be engaged to him. And lo and behold, what do you suspect happens? She winds up kind of getting trapped in a contract where they eventually fall in love. It's a whole thing. You know the plot. You can get the plot just from having reading the back of the book. I gave this three stars. It was fine. Once again, they continue to call each other by each other's names. I'm convinced that people don't really do this in real life. So if you're addressing someone by name multiple times in the span of a single scene or conversation where there's no one else in the room, that is unnecessary. Why are we continuing to write that? I don't know. But this book was interesting. It was fine. I don't think I enjoyed it as much as some of Talia Hibbert's other work. I also listened to this on audio and... I was surprised to find that it was narrated by a man. Normally romance books, if they're not narrated by two separate voices, it's normally someone who predominantly identifies as a woman. And this book was narrated by a man who I think was named Colin or Connor or Colton or something. And so subsequently his voice for Cherry, the main character, was like squeaky and high pitched and, and very breathy and up here. And I was, I was a little bit condescended by it the whole time. <laughs> so I think if I were to try any of these again, because I think this is the first one in a in one of those series I was just describing. Uh, I might do it in print as opposed to listening to it. Our October book for the Library Book Club was Everyone Knows Your Mother is a Witch by Rivka Galchen. And this book I gave three stars to, even though nobody in my book club really enjoyed it. This book is about the mother of Johannes Kepler and how she is absolutely accused of being a witch wrongfully by a bunch of people in her town. And it is essentially a portrait of how still today women who are deviant in any way or choose to be independent and strong and speak what they think uh, without being fearsome of the repercussions are branded as witches. This is all set in the 1600s and it's a meandering story that I think could have used a little bit more structure but also takes the form of her dictating the main character dictating her feelings and her record of what's going on to her because she cannot read or write. She's dictating it to the man who is her legal guardian. Even as an old woman and a widow, she has a legal guardian because, you know, 1600s. So she's, she's talking through all of it. It's intermixed with that person, so the, the man she's dictating it to, it's intermixed with his understanding of what's going on. There are some letters in there. It's kind of all over the place and it makes it difficult to read, although I think it is quite reflective, that style uh, of the way that history might have been transcribed back in the time. And now here in a time where people are starting to keep records of things in a more perfunctory and systematic way, they're still figuring out how to do that. So it, it feels like it's reflective of the time that it's meant to be set in. I thought it was fine. I wanted to enjoy it more than I did. And I think I gave it three stars. I don't know that I would actually recommend this book unless you have a specific interest in that time period in the 16, 1615, 1618 they're in or about Johannes Kepler. This book could have done such an interesting thing and like veered toward actually being about Johannes Kepler instead of being about his mother and gotten into the science and his role as the imperial mathematician and astrology and it could have very easily been a book about him and it wasn't. He was just a player in it. So if that's what you're looking for going into it, that is that is not what happens. And it very much focuses on, on her as a woman in the time period that she's in, which points for doing that and not taking the easy way out, Rivka Galchen. Well done. And finally, the book that I read most recently in October was Tessa Dare's A Week to be Wicked. Now, as you'll remember, I only read mass market paperback romances that are having something to do with Scotland. And this is about a girl who is sort of bookish and plain and she's a middle child and she is secretly a geologist and she needs to get to a geology convention up in Edinburgh. So in a way of events that I will not disclose, she winds up snagging a Viscount to take her to Edinburgh from like the south of, of 
England and it takes them a week to get there. It's full of adventure and mishaps and guns and dealing with past trauma and figuring out like who you are as a person in this society where men are just supreme overlords and women have no place, blah blah blah. All that stuff that you know, should come to light in each of these books and deserves more detail. But the book takes place over the course of a week and in the formula of romance I found that this did not have like the the big catastrophic incident that was gonna rip them apart once they found like they got together. Like there was really no time needed at the end for repair. It was a very easy like oh yes it's very obvious that we're gonna be together and we're gonna spend a lot of this trying to deny our feelings but then there was a moment of open communication and they got everything out on the table and it was smooth sailing from there so this did not have the formula that I was anticipating and I actually didn't hate that so as usual with other Tessa Dare books that I've read um I I, I enjoyed this it was well done I liked both of the characters well enough and I thought they had an appropriate amount of backstory and detail. I have never read a female character who was the the star of one of these books who had glasses so that was new and everything about like the main character here was like new and different and I think I've determined that in in series like these where there's like a family of women and eventually there's a book about each of the daughters in the family. Uh, I like to start in the middle and that's what I did here. So now I get to go back and read books one and three and I think I only picked this out because it was recommended to me on Libby as being like a librarian pick or something like that. So way to go librarians. Uh, Tessa Dare is the way to go. Grace Burroughs, take a hint. Take the hint check out her work because Too Scott to Handle was too poor to recommend. And there you have it, 13 books in quarter three. We'll see how many I get up to in quarter four. I am two books behind in my uh, hunt for achieving my Goodreads reading goal, so we'll see if I can make up some of that time with only two months left of the year now. If you've read any of the books I've talked about, I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comments. I hope you're having lovely weeks and lovely lives. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you very soon.